The 1930s in the United States are defined by the most significant economic crisis in American history, the Great Depression. But portions of the Great Plains were hit with a double blow in the 1930s. Not only was this region severely affected by the Great Depression, but the Plains were also hit simultaneously with a tremendous ecological crisis, the Dust Bowl. In 1936, as the people of the Great Plains were facing severe drought, failing crops, dangerous dust storms, and collapsing farm revenue, the U.S. federal government released a documentary film about this calamity, The Plow That Broke the Plains. This film was part of a much larger campaign by the Roosevelt administration to not just educate the public about the Dust Bowl, but to convince people of a particular story about the causes of the Dust Bowl and to support New Deal policies that address these causes. The film was both critically acclaimed and controversial for a number of reasons. The Plow That Broke the Plains was written and directed by Per Lorenz, a writer and film critic who had created a text for a photography book about President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This led to an introduction to Rexford Tugwell, an economist who was heading the Resettlement Administration, the New Deal agency charged with providing relief to struggling rural families. Tugwell chose Lorenz to make a film about the causes and consequences of the prolonged drought that was crippling agriculture in parts of the Great Plains. Filmed on location in Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, and Texas, this 28-minute film cost $19,260 to produce in 1936. That's about $360,000 in 2020. Through its minimalist narration by Thomas Chalmers and moving score by Virgil Thompson, the film makes a case for land misuse, overplowing, and overfarming of marginal farmland as the underlying cause of the Dust Bowl. The film also promotes the resettlement of destitute farmers and the restoration of the Great Plains grasslands as part of the solution to the crisis. The initial controversy surrounding the plow that broke the plains has to do with its very existence as a film. Should the U.S. government even be in the business of making movies? Many of the major studios in Hollywood certainly believe the answer to this question was a resounding no. Movies funded and filmed by the government could be seen as a threat to the private movie industry. Government films would have an unfair advantage when competing with commercially produced films from this perspective, as they would not have to be beholden to market forces and the need to turn a profit. It probably also didn't help Lorenz's standing in Hollywood that a few years earlier he co-wrote a book highly critical of the film industry. Hollywood's disapproval of the film could have led to some serious consequences, as none of the studios would agree to distribute the film commercially. The first showing was at the White House, and for a while after that, it was primarily shown only in independent theaters, school auditoriums, hotel meeting spaces, and the like, with Lorenz himself traveling around the country, film canister in hand, personally promoting these screenings. Finally, the Rialto Theater in Times Square, New York City, agreed to show the film. It was so popular and the critical reaction so positive that many mainstream theaters relented and started showing it. After playing in 3,000 theaters across the country, the film entered the federal circuit of Army bases, Navy ships, and CCC camps. In 1937 alone, the movie was seen by around 10 million people. However, Hollywood studios were not the only ones to object to the U.S. government making films. Charges of government propaganda were leveled against the movie, most prominently by FDR's political opponents and others skeptical of the massive expansion of federal government programs during the Great Depression. Per Lorenz once described documentary film as, quote, a factual film which is dramatic. But does documentary only just inform and educate the public? Does this dramatic element help persuade voters that the current administration is doing a good job? Is the plow that broke the plains government propaganda? And is this necessarily a bad thing? Do we only see propaganda as negative if we disagree with the message? These are all questions that were debated at the time and continue to be discussed about government-funded filmmaking. Another set of controversies surrounding the film have to do with the story being told about the causes of the Dust Bowl. The film presents the large swaths of grassland that once made up the ecosystem of the Great Plains as fundamentally unsuitable for large-scale human cultivation. This movie shows the unspoiled beauty of the prairie in contrast to the effects of decades of European-American settlement. 
As the story progresses, we see waves of cattle, railroads, homesteaders, horses, and finally plows breaking up the soil and transforming the millions of acres of grassland into productive ranches and farmland. But the consequences of this transformation is the crisis of the 1930s, with drought and dust storms creating a wasteland where the endless expanse of prairie grasses once waved in the wind. So is the film putting the blame in the right place? Was the wide-scale plowing of the plains and the rapid expansion of agricultural production the main cause of the Dust Bowl? Critics at the time and even today would argue that environmental forces, like cycles of drought and rain, were equally to blame for the Dust Bowl. And Lorenz is careful not to impart bad motives like greed or selfish economic gain on the part of farmers and ranchers in the Great Plains. The film puts the blame squarely on the shoulders of mechanized agriculture and overplowing. But it still leaves open the question, are farmers and ranchers in this region dedicated stewards of the land or captive dupes to the power of new technologies and capitalist profit motives, or perhaps both? And what role should the federal government play in conservation, land management, and agricultural production? We are still actively debating these questions over eight decades after the plow that broke the plains was made. And perhaps we will be debating them for eight decades more.